<laughs> hey guys. Hi Mike. How you doing? Good. Good to see you. Yeah, you too. You too. Do I need to raise my hand? I think. Uh... No, I think you've already been put as a panelist. All oh, of us are here on the top row. You can see those are excellent. us. Excellent. Uh, Jad is here as the A, and he's our host, and will be supporting us if we need anything. Super. And uh, we've got participants already waiting for us. And uh, shall we kick off? Let's roll. Nice to see you, Dennis. Very nice to see you, Mark. Uh, beautiful. I'll actually start with uh, an introduction. Um, uh, I'll start with Mike. Mike is the Chief Digital Officer at Banque Saudi al Faransi. And before that, he was one of the founding team of a bank clearly based in the UAE and has a long and storied career in uh, the banking sector. Uh, bank clearly uh, was a, a digital uh, bank or a challenger bank and, um, uh, that so Mike has the experience on both the startup side and building a startup digital bank, as well as on the large corporate side. And uh, Dennis was formerly the uh, chief digital officer at uh, National Bank of Kuwait. He's a digital banking leader and expert. Before that was with, uh, if I'm not mistaken, TEB Bank, Dennis, yes. in Turkey, where he was leading digital and uh, was working very closely with the startup community there. TEB is very strongly established as a FinTech leader. Um, so a, a privilege to have you both with us. Thank you so much for your time, gentlemen. Always a pleasure. Um, so let's dive right in. We've got a lot of questions and um, I'll, put, I'll put a note to our uh, attendees. If you'd like to ask a question, please feel free to put it in the Q&A. Uh, I will keep monitoring that Q&A as much as possible. Uh, so that I can uh, uh, answer, ask our panelists the questions. So, and we have a couple of polls, uh, so that'll pop up uh, on the screen that we'll ask our attendees to, to answer questions around the future of banking, to get a bit of a sense of their thoughts as well and have this be more interactive. So uh, I'll ask the attendees as well as our panelists to watch out for the polls. Uh, Jad, I will cue the different polls. I know what they are, I'm ready for that, so, so ready to do this. So let's start. Uh, today, both of you are leaders of digital transformation and working closely with senior bank management. Um, COVID-19 must be rapidly accelerating this digital transformation in the industry and must also be transforming consumer behavior uh, or at least accelerating a change in consumer behavior. Uh, I'd like to start with the consumer behavior and what, how do you think these behaviors will be permanently changed when it comes to banking uh, in the future post-COVID. Uh, and Mike, let's start with you, then we'll go over to Dennis. Yeah, sure thing. Um, so I, I'm not sure that, that consumer behavior has actually changed, right? Um, because it already has, right? So I don't think because of this, we're going to see further changes, et cetera. I think we're lagging the, the you know, the kind of, you know, those changes in consumer behavior that happened even before COVID-19, you know, that appetite and thirst for digital, especially kind of mobile first solutions will surely be bigger than ever. And that behavior and mindset is, is fundamentally different, you know, today. You know, when I look at, you know, what consumers are like today, they don't trust brands like they used to. They trust what their friends kind of think and they trust those opinions of others. You know, they don't buy on price like they used to. They look for experience first and foremost. So, so not always kind of, you know, as, um, as price sensitive. And that kind of one size kind of, you know, fit all approach just doesn't work. It's about how do we get to that segment of one. And those days of banks just being reactive all the time to, to what customers want from a service perspective, uh, from a product perspective, they, they've gone. You know, the banks that kind of demonstrate proactivity now uh, in line with that thirst and appetite from, from the, the, that's coming from consumer behavior are going to be the ones that will win, in my opinion. <clears throat> so, uh, Dennis, sure, give us, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, the, our customer behaviors has already started to change uh, and we were expecting a big change on the industry because of this customer uh, behavior change. And uh, this COVID, uh, it's before the, uh, this pandemic, now it's accelerated the pace on our side. 
And previously, uh, in many institutions, think about that these behavior changes coming mainly for the youth segments or uh, much more uh, uh, digital uh, savvy people. Now it's coming from the old segments. So I think this will be one of the uh, major change before the, according to before the pandemic. So it's going to push kind of the more reluctant digital consumers to and accelerate their, their, their digitization. So if today we believe that we are on the full trajectory that maybe we were on before, but now it's accelerated, what does that look, what does that change the outlook for the bank of the future or even your investments that you're making um, in the future? What areas do you think you're going to invest less in or banks are going to invest less in? In which areas are they going to accelerate their investment? And maybe we'll start with you, Dennis, then shift to Mike on this one. So this uh, pandemic re uh, literally changed uh, many banks' action in a very uh, short period of time. They moved the call center to the, uh, their employees' houses, so uh, the services uh, started giving out of the uh, branches. And people now uh, experiencing this and expecting in the future. So my uh, expectation for the uh, future as a change, apart uh, from the uh, so operational side, uh, cybersecurity, financing, these are the uh, structural uh, banking sites. There will be definitely big changes. But the consumer side, uh, my expectation is uh, more on the physical advisory side. Branch role will be disappear, and we will see the uh, decreasing the number of branches uh, very uh, dramatically. In some of the, of the geographies, it will be uh, uh, fast at the moment, but we will see this uh, uh, mostly uh, in most uh, geographies. So, so, but you you clustered this then is into two chunks, right? One which is operationally cybersecurity. You mentioned uh, process automation, probably. Are there any other points that that you think? Even yeah, Just to flesh that idea out yeah. further, because I think these are all interesting opportunities as well for SMEs that want to work with banks, right? Where they can support maybe in some of these areas. So if you could just uh, go into those maybe in a bit more detail. Uh, I think uh, this uh, COVID-19 affect the banks uh, on uh, four major areas. Uh, one of them, operational impact. We are talking about the customer behavior, but this is also part of the operations. The other one is the credit risk, loss of the income and liquidity. In uh, banks, we'll see a sudden impact on their uh, revenue sheets, uh, as well as the uh, customer behavior change and also the funding the banks, because these are the major changes. Uh, the banks will struggle uh, all these uh, factors. Uh, just uh, above these uh, four factors, uh, one of them is the customer behavior, as we talk. Uh, we will see the impact of the digital uh, most on this area. Okay. Mike, I would love to hear your thoughts on this. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dennis yeah. giving these kind of four buckets and some even operational areas, cybersecurity, process automation, some of these things. H how do you see the change in investment moving forward or areas of particular interest? Yeah, sure. Um, so, so very aligned with Dennis for sure. And, and it, it's no surprise, right? But, you know, with the exception of kind of quality of workspace for employees, I genuinely hope that real estate is the first victim of bank investment in the coming years, right? You know, um, that need for branches, et cetera. You know, people that know me will know that I'm not a fan and there's reasons why, and we can go into that later in, in, in the conversation. Um, but for now, it, it still remains non-negotiable. You know, we've got to run two speeds of business, i.e. we've got to continue to invest in our kind of legacy, you know, operating models until our future kind of business models can do all and even more than what legacy can. So we've got to play a bit of catch up, right? There's plenty of stuff that we just can't do digital and we still rely on that physical and it deserves that level of investment still. I think, you know, technology obviously will continue to be a mainstay of investment. Um, but I believe that, you know, that continued and even increased investment in talent is going to be imperative, right? So this is taking it out a little bit step further than what Dennis was saying. You know, I'm a big believer you get what you pay for and that, you know, when you get the best talent, it in turn, it attracts the best talent. And it means that we've got to be ready to kind of pay up for people. We've got to be ready to lock them in and continue to invest in people. And after all, you know, it, it's, it is that talent and those people that kind of, 
create the innovations and tell the technology what to do. And if I had to bet my life on anything in terms of, you know, for more investment, it would be around data science and that analytic capability. You know, for us at BSF, it's right at the top of our agenda. Okay, excellent. So, and uh, data analytics uh, and data capabilities in particular, and probably both on a technology and a talent perspective. A hundred percent. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. And, and sadly, we've still got to start. <clears throat> to, we've still got to continue to at least try and modernize the branch experience because until regulation and digital can provide a lot of what branch does, we have no option, right? Yeah. And Omar, uh, I want to add that, uh, especially on this time, behavior of the banks to the, their customers, as well as the employees, everybody will remember how the banks uh, behaving at this moment to the employee and the customers very well at the end of this pandemic. And they will choose, uh, their choices will change, uh, even for the uh, job security, even for the working environment, even for the uh, technology, providing technology and the solutions to customers will be really important because uh, most of the bank have a digital transformation agenda for one to three years. Now it yeah. will be speed up in a days and weeks. And uh, investing to the people and the technology uh, really the uh, key for the uh, change. I'm a little bit, uh, I'm, I want to use an analogy uh, in Formula One race. Uh, the uh, ranking won't change easily, but <laughs> during the uh, rain tour, everything is possible. Yeah, Currently, yeah. we are in the rain tour, so we need to uh, think about the current crisis management thing as well as the uh, post uh, pandemic uh, times. Yeah. Great analogy, Dennis. Yeah, fascinating. You know, we, we all remember the people that stood by us through the tough times. And customers and employees will do exactly the same. It's all about how we react to this. So uh, given that we've talked a little bit now about regulation, I know it's not one of the questions that I had in mind before, but we did get it from Gabi Abiyad. He asks, do you see regulators in the Gulf pushing digital identity and digital signature post COVID or due to COVID? And I would extend that to digital onboarding, digital KYC, AML, everything related to reg tech, all of this has to now rapidly change in order for banks to be able to deliver these services. Uh, last year, he was saying UAE Pass was endorsed by the UAE Central Bank, but it didn't seem like any bank adopted it for digital account opening. How do you think regulators are going to respond in this environment? Yeah, so, I, um, so I've definitely seen SAMA on the front foot. And I'm, I, you know, I can only talk from a, from a Saudi perspective. Um, but, you know, when I... <laughs> I, th I think about, you know, digital onboarding, it's been there for some time now, it's become the norm, it's great to see that that's happening, but I, I want to be able to push asset products, I need to lend to make money, uh, you know, the experience of still having to do stuff with paper, um, and, and the likes is, is just not kind of digital. And, you know, Sama came out very quickly, um, with even though they said that they weren't going to kind of evolve regulation, during this crisis time, but Sam came out and said, okay, banks, um, it's not just kind of sandbox type stuff now where you can open a credit card digitally. We want you to push it for personal loans and things like that and be able to apply, you know, approve, underwrite and disperse money. So Sam has been great. You know, they're right on the front foot. They see a need for this. They know that people can't go into branches and do things the other way. And they've been extremely proactive in, in changing that regulation. But do, will, do you expect to see a flurry of new companies, startup services that are supporting the digitization of these regulatory processes? Um, I or think is this going to be developed in-house by, by the, the central banks? I, I think that, you know, a lot of it kind of exists already from maybe more developed digital markets. So it's about opening the doors and bring these in. I'm never a fan of kind of trying to reinvent the wheel and build something that a fintech's already done and it'll probably do better, quicker, more efficient than, than what we will ever do. Um, so I think there's a lot more appetite, you know, for that type of stuff as well. Interesting. Dennis, your, your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, these times, interesting times, and all the governments are very busy to uh, create a remedy and create a 
the labyrinth effects of these uh, lockdowns, curfews, and the uh, impact. So especially on these times, regulators are very, very active. And my expectation is uh, regulators really push forward lots of these uh, changes. Uh, and also the public institutions, public banks will also increase the uh, their uh, usage of the uh, digital. Uh, because previously, uh, some of the actions, digital onboarding, customer acquisition, this kind of stuff, uh, we are talking about the risk, but now if you don't do this, there's another uh, risk. That's why uh, regulators will be much more active and uh, pushy to put the uh, uh, these uh, bricks into the place to accelerate the digital transformation. Okay, very interesting. So I think clearly there's going to be a big regulatory push. Um, maybe we have all the infrastructure and tools already, and all we needed was a little push into that swimming pool, and this COVID is going to be that little <laughs> push that we needed to jump into the swimming pool. Yeah, it, it's, it's not even the push, right? It's just the permission. I, I think, you know, banks you know, that, are, that, that have got people like Dennis and I in uh, are being held back. You know, we want to jump. You know, what? we want to go and dive bomb, right? It's permission now to go and do that. Well, that's great. So that's super exciting for you, I'm sure. And I'm sure also for a lot of fintechs who, who want to work with you. So, um, but uh, I will continue on that front separately. Let's talk about branches. Um, we're already talking about shrinking the branch network. People were already talking about shrinking the branch network anyways, right? But then there's also, there were all sorts of ideas about the reinvented branch, right? The branch as cafe. Uh, one company I talked to talked to me about the branch as training center. Like an Apple store, you go and you get trained on Apple tools and, and softwares, branch as training center. Branch as advisory structure, right? Because these relationships, you go get advice on your investment. Um, Will, does COVID change this outlook on what the function of branches will be? Uh, what, do you, what do you think about this? Um, so for me, you know, my previous point of continue to invest until we've got better options is the only option. That said, I fully expect branches to become a thing of the past. I genuinely believe that the only reason why we need them and customers still use them is because our operating models offer no alternatives and we've got to change that you know particularly in this region the thought of in the middle of july having to find parking in the middle of riyadh on a busy work day to go into a branch <clears throat> to do something is horrendous right who wants to do that i don't believe that consumers kind of demand that we just don't give an option and so, and so these, all these different ideas, you don't, you don't think any of them is really, right? I'd just rather get this all done from my phone. I don't want a cafe. If I want a cafe, I'll go to a Starbucks. If I want a training, I'll go to a training center. You're not buying it. Look, banking's a utility. I turn my tap on and I don't want to understand what happened, you know, and how we did desalination and all of that type of thing. I don't need that. You know, banking is a utility. Make it as simple and easy, as frictionless and hassle-free as possible there's a lot of value add stuff that we can do on top of the utility stuff but fundamentally that's what it is before we take your input on this dennis jad i'd like to cue the first poll um so if we can do that it really asks about people's interest if they could accomplish everything digitally would they still visit the branch for advice personal relationships entertainment any other reasons that they might visit the branch Jad, Perfect. If you can, we're going to give everyone just a, a moment to answer that question quickly. And then Dennis will turn to you as well. We'd love to hear your thoughts on what that branch might look like. Uh, do you guys also get a, a panelists? Do you get the, the poll, poll as well? We get it, but it says that we're not allowed to vote. That's ah, we're not allowed to vote. I can't no. vote either. <laughs> okay. Well, panelists, uh, attendees, if you'll please vote. And uh, I think that's enough time. Let's continue. We'll uh, wait a few minutes and then we'll put up the results once Jad lets us know that uh, enough people have had the chance to vote. Dennis, uh, your thoughts on, on the, the branch? Yeah. Uh, to answer your uh, question directly, definitely the uh, number of the branches decreased very dramatically and there will be no needs because previously we are pushing the customers for their transaction. But now 
during the uh, pandemic time, uh, also uh, customers uh, get the, also the uh, consultancy advisory uh, from their uh, out of the branches. So, and human being is uh, get used to uh, comfort, comfort very quickly. And just after uh, testing this, uh, I don't expect them to go back uh, a lot. Uh, on the other hand, two things avoid people uh, to go to the digital mainly. One of them is uh, afraid of them making the mistakes and uh, able to uh, put the responsibility to someone else who is working on the branch. And the other one is the literacy. Now, uh, all the banks educating their customers very quickly. Uh, and people have to, uh, customers have to learn uh, to continue their business. So uh, as to answer your questions directly, uh, definitely the role uh, and the number of the branch uh, very uh, decrease very dramatically. Okay. Um, so if not the branch, then maybe there are going to be other new technology trends, right? That are going to, uh, you know, be critical in the next five years. And, you know, I put a couple of thoughts. I can imagine like virtual reality banking or maybe beacons that the bank can use to communicate with or to offer me personalized offers. Social media banking where I can do everything and pay my, my friends and um, which has historically been the realm of the large technology companies, right? This is where we see a direct potential overlap or kind of competition between the banks and the technology companies. I'm curious, which of these technologies do you see being adopted readily? Are banks excited about? And which ones you think, you know, virtual reality banking? I'm not so sure about it. But I'm curious which one for you that might be. Um, and uh, maybe you'd start, Mike. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I still think, you know, that human interaction is very important, particularly when it comes to advisory at this stage. Um, me personally, I'm not ready to trust a robo advisor 100 percent with all of my cash i like to kind of seek multiple opinion and that type of thing but i'm happy to do it over a zoom call with my banker right it's fine i don't need that but if i if i really look honestly for me the top three trends are simple it's data it's data and it's data and it's this data and analytics that are it for me you know i think we're, they're going to continue to get better they're going to get more powerful, smarter and more insightful. And our use of data just has such power to transform and create new business models, new opportunities, new experiences, and, and take us from that shift of being a very reactive business to something that's very proactive. And it's that, that kind of shift to a segment of one. And honestly, and maybe I'm just not visionary enough, right? Um, but I just see that whole virtual reality stuff and lots of other tech, even beacons. I've got plenty of use cases, but they're just enabling infrastructure and, and, and a bit gimmicky. Right. And, you know, I think, you know, we've got a rule that, you know, we don't do gimmicks. There's no room for gimmicks. We do stuff that adds value to the, to the customer. It'll save them money. It'll save us money. It'll reduce risk or enhance us experience. And that's it. And I genuinely believe that data will do so much of that. I love it. Uh, so data is king. And then a lot of the other stuff, it's going to be gimmick. It's going to be kind of <clears throat> icing on the cake, but not really the substance of it. Yeah. Uh, Dennis, I'm curious if you agree or you have a different take on this. 100%. 100%. Okay. Agree. One more thing is important. Nobody said blockchain. Nobody said, uh, uh, you know, customer experience, all the buzzwords that we hear all the time right now. You know what? For me, customer experience is just a hygiene factor. It's got to be there, right? And yes. the data allows it to be even better. Sorry, Dennis. Anyway. No, 100%. No, no, I like this. We're, 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 we're all friends. So let's have a chat, right? <laughs> Dennis. Uh, for me, uh, so uh, even in the uh, technology, even in the digital world, the uh, human uh, factor is uh, the biggest need for the, uh, our customers. That's why we need to put this human factor into the whole thing. And uh, I call the conversational banking, it's conversational banking backed by the advanced analytics. It should even the chat, even the video call, even a real person, even a, 
a smart chatbot. It depends on the customers, different segments looking for different things, but we need to put a, a seamless uh, conversational banking uh, onto the uh, channels. Currently, we are expecting the customers come to us, even our mobile application. We want them to come to our mobile banking app and doing the transactions over there. So we need to be uh, embed all these things to the, their uh, digital experiences. It should be seamless conversational banking. So the technologies for that is the all the uh, chat technologies. Uh, advanced analytics for predictions is really critical. And all this stuff, you uh, everybody knows that now uh, Zoom today launched the, their new secure uh, application, Zoom 5.0, just after last week's uh, issues. So cybersecurity will be the really key uh, because it will be the biggest barrier uh, in front of the uh, uh, moving the customers to the digital. Okay, interesting. So um, customer experience has to run through everything. It's hygiene. Uh, the fundamentals are going to be around data. Uh, so um, before, we, before we continue here, maybe we can get the results, Jad, of our previous question. Uh, the poll of the branch. And great. We have not, not exactly what I expected. If yeah, you me neither. All your transactions digitally, 37% said they would still visit the branch for some purpose. Yeah, uh, Amaraj, I think now uh, the uh, efforts will go to carry the advice parts to the digital channels from the branches. I'm sorry, I, I missed that part. Can you say that again, Dennis, please? Uh, especially on these questions, uh, all the transactions, but people uh, really need to talk uh, to go to the branches to get the advice. So uh, my expectation is the banks will work on the advice parts. As Mike said, he wants to talk with his uh, bankers through the uh, video call. So I, I, I'm truly, I'm truly surprised about this because I, the, what, everything I read about, the younger you are, the less comfortable you are with interacting with other humans. Uh, if I talk to people since really the boom in online ordering, the people that I talk to, they don't even want to pick up a phone and order food. If you got to pick up a phone, I just won't even order from that restaurant. If it's not on delivery on the app, it doesn't exist. And I'm so, with it. And I'm nearly 50, right? So uh, 100%. But I think, Dennis, it's interesting, this idea of going to the customer and being on their channels, right? So instead of being on an app, you're on my, you're on my WhatsApp as a, as a contact. And you're, oh, right. telling, you're reminding me, you're engaging me across the channels that I most care about. So I think that's definitely an interesting one. Uh, uh, so I'm going to queue a second poll that we have based on this small chat about technologies. Uh, although I can't, uh, I don't know if we can change right now, but people, I wanted to ask a question, virtual reality banking, social media payment, and, and banking services. Let's ask our audience, which do they think? Uh, what are you most interested in? Uh, so let's see what people have to, to say on this front. And in the meanwhile, we'll continue our chat. Um, we've talked about the branches, we've talked about the technologies. Um, the, another place that's rapidly changing for, for, for everybody now, we were just talking about it, is e-commerce. Everything has become e-commerce today. Everything is digital payment. People don't want to touch cash anymore. They don't want to touch money because it might be infected. Money was already kind of, um, it's one of the, the dirtiest things because so many people touch it. But with that shift, towards cashless society being accelerated. Will the bank have a new role in the payments and e-commerce space that it maybe didn't have before? And what role might that be? Who wants to take a stab at that first? Dennis. I'm gonna let Dennis do Mike. that because yeah, I'm Dennis, not a Dennis. payments expert. I've got some opinions, Good. but he's got better at this than me. Okay. Uh, at the beginning, there's a, a because uh, being locked down, uh, push the people to get the cash. So at the beginning, there was a, there was a uh, demand on the cash. But as you said, because of the, it's a dirty thing, it's the, uh, because of the virus, they don't want to touch. So it definitely it will accelerate the digital payments. Uh, and most of the bank uh, at the same time responding to increase the cash transaction limit. And so far, so good. It will uh, use the lots. 
So we will see this kind of stuff. Uh, on the other uh, parts, uh, uh, my expectation is this will also in, uh, accelerate the central bank's digital currency. Because maybe you remember uh, in the uh, Senate bill in the US, they want uh, offering a digital wallet to distribute this helicopter money to everybody uh, easily because uh, I, my expectation is, is also accelerating the, uh, this kind of trust. China is in a very advanced position. Now we can see some of the uh, Western uh, countries uh, and increase the contactless uh, payment a lot. Uh, and uh, my expect another expectation is uh, increase the collaboration between the tech companies, all these tech giants and the banks uh, will go up. Why do you think that? Why do you think that the tech companies won't try to do it themselves? I mean, Venmo today, you know, uh, I visit the US on an annual basis and now Venmo has become such a strong trend in the United States. It's a verb, Venmo me this, Venmo me that. Nobody deals with cash, and, like literally nobody deals with cash. Not even like, Cards, one person might pay for a meal on their card, and then everybody, all the other transactions are through a technology company and not a bank. Um, I personally would see maybe banks a closer fit to telcos who are also trying to figure out what they're going to do in this whole space. Uh, what do you think? Why do you think that banks are going to collaborate with tech companies not compete? Yeah, the, for, for the banks, uh, the reason that I'm saying this, uh, not uh, there are very few banks who have this capital and big customer base to offer and make this uh, mass widely used. On the other hand, uh, tech fins, uh, especially we will see the uh, currently we saw before the pandemic, uh, Apple Goldman uh, last week, uh, Google announced uh, their uh, debit card. They got a huge customer base, and this uh, will uh, gives the bank in a very uh, rapid way to expand the system, expand the usage. On the other hand, uh, these tech things uh, did uh, one thing uh, cleverly. They uh, prefer to work with the banks, financial institutions as a backend provider. Not, uh, they are not trying to get rid of them. Uh, even the uh, Goldman case, even the uh, Google case. So uh, I think to expand, to make these things as a, uh, uh, used massively, uh, so this collaboration will meet. Well, I think it'll be interesting as well. These guys, they can be very, very collaborative until you figure out that they just ate your lunch. So <laughs> I don't, I don't, we'll have to see how, and I am there, of course, uh, I understand. No, I, I think uh, the biggest shot. reason for these tech things is uh, the risk management system of the banks are uh, really uh, good. So and the banks will provide them uh, uh, these uh, risk management systems uh, to uh, increase the acceleration of uh, digital payments. And I can see that for fintechs, I see it less for large scale companies like Google and Facebook and Microsoft, who can themselves build very robust risk systems, who can acquire licenses. But let's leave that conversation, I think, for another day. We have so many awesome questions from our panelists, from our attendees. I'm gonna ask a few of them. Uh, let's start with one. Um, we talked a lot about data. Both of you agree that data is super important. It is the future. Data is often seen as the flip side also of open banking. So the question here is knowing that open banking is a major step towards transforming financial services, uh, do you see this FinTech trend growing in MENA? Undoubtedly bring it on sooner the better and you know for me the, 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 there's two sides to to open banking there's the first one around you know what's really good for the consumer and to create you know that that transparency across you know kind of you know the multiple bank accounts that they may have etc um, and fine you know I still think there's huge opportunities for banks to be able to you know, capitalize on on uh, on the open banking space. But I also look at it, you know, and, you know, we're thinking about this very, very seriously um, and I've done done some of it already at, at Bank Saudi Franci, where um, we have that open banking where we allow fintech to collaborate with us. So it's not just kind of, you know, sharing data between the banks, but also, 
here's a platform. We're going to expose all of our APIs. We're going to let you guys, you know, kind of utilize them. We'll do bank as a service. And, you know, I'm forever looking for ways to further monetize things that, that we have, because I genuinely think that, you know, as, as a big incumbent legacy bank, there are lots of, um, you know, kind of strengths that we have, which the, you know, the, you know, the smaller guys don't. So let me monetize that as well. But if, if I push, the, push on this a little bit further, Mike, don't you kind of risk becoming um, a utility player that is just the back end? You risk the customer relationship, you risk uh, the differentiation, you become an owner of a license and a provider of data services. Now, you could tell me that that might be the more interesting part of the value chain to play in, but isn't that a danger? Look, I think, you know, longer term, that there is a real chance that, you know, banks that don't transform quick enough will just become wholesale lenders, period. And, and you know, they'll just, you know, deploy their balance sheet to other people that can do it smarter, quicker, they can acquire customers better, and they can get a better return. And that may be the case. You know, you look at Lending Club and, and you know, the reason why that thing is so bloody big now is not because, you know, you know, Omar lends me some money on that platform. It's because banks and other institutions realize that by throwing balance sheet on there, you know, I can get a better return. They can manage risk better and all of this. So, you know, it, it, it doesn't worry me. Um, honestly, it doesn't worry me, that type of thing. Um, okay. I still think that, the, and, and look, you know, you look at a lot of the, you know, the new guys, and I think the reason why a lot of, um, you know, the digital challenges today aren't making money is because they just don't have the capital and the balance sheet to be able to lend. We've always got that. We'll always have it. It will continue forever to be a barrier to entry, um, to have that kind of scale. And certainly when you look at the, you know, the wholesale side of the business, the corporate banking side of the business, you know, I don't see how fintech can um, can do that balance sheet side. And I wish there was more fintech on the corporate side and the wholesale side, but, you know, there's just not. So. And I think that's a huge opportunity that is completely untapped Absolutely. or very, very untapped, right? Yeah. Yeah. All these fintechs are working on the consumer market. Yeah. So few fintechs are serving the, the corporate market, the large enterprise customers within this space. I think it's a super interesting. But that reminds me actually of another panel that I was on where a panelist said something interesting. He said, there will be front end banks and there will be back end banks. And maybe Mike, what you're saying is those that can't cut it in the, will not be able to transform quickly enough, might end up being those back end banks. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, then as I saw you shaking your head in agreement, since we have a lot of questions, I'm gonna actually push a different question to you. You already talked about different uh, customer segments and how important that is to understand customer segments. A question from Abdurrahman Ahmad who asks, do you think a single digital bank can service a wide range of customer segments or will we see fragmentation of banks that serve individual customer segments? My belief is a, a digital bank can be personalized according to the, each individual. And this is not about the age thing. Uh, mostly it's about the, uh, digital literacy and uh, digital mindset. So it can be. Uh, for example, in my past uh, digital bank, uh, we created the three different uh, value proposition into one single uh, digital bank. Uh, so uh, I believe it can be. But can the brand really go across all of these, the value proposition? I mean, if you're a hip, youthful, young brand, does that mean you... I, I, would, I would kind of change, I, I change my question. The idea that uh, kids don't like to shop for jeans in the same house, in the same stores that their parents shop for jeans. <laughs> Can we really play that role? Can you extend that far across these customer segments? Uh, so uh, currently, uh, the technology and the digital uh, elasticity of the digital uh, front end gives us uh, this uh, personalization. Uh, so I can... Uh, I can push a different uh, messages, different uh, front ends, uh, different uh, function sets uh, to the each individual. So it can be manageable. But uh, of course, there will be some uh, players uh, focusing on the uh, dedicated segments. We will see. We will see. Okay. 
Interesting, Mike. Did you have a different perspective? You chuckled a little at my question. No, no, no. I was, I was chuckling because it, I, I was agreeing absolutely. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Dennis, Dennis is definitely like my brother from another mother. I think. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a, it's a pleasure. The, the dynamic is, is really enjoyable on this session. I'm, 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 I'm enjoying this tremendously. Uh, I'll ask another question from, um, from our uh, panel or attendees. If the customers in your market are moving towards full digitization, do you start to see international digital banks or international digital players also as a threat, given how quickly they'll be able to expand across borders, things like this? How, how do you see such, uh, such banks as a threat, as a partner? So if, if, if Monzo got a license tomorrow in Saudi, I'd be a little bit worried no doubt um if monzo lift and dropped exactly what they had in london into saudi i'd be more excited because i don't think it would work i think hyper localization is required um this one size fits all absolutely doesn't work um you know when when i look at the way we're designing things and the level of primary research that we do it is all around hyper localization it's different the way we do things is different the way we talk to customers um but honestly as well i feel quite protected by our regulator for now at least in terms of um not letting these guys come in and you know the other thing realistically maybe they don't know what a golden opportunity saudi arabia is maybe they're just focused on western europe and the us and they've got enough on their minds. But you know what? We'll build something just as good, if not better, than what they have. We've got the talent, we've got the means, we've got the drive, the passion, the ambition. You know, it's, um, you know, we go home, go big or go home, right? Excellent. Dennis, you, do you agree or have a different perspective? Uh, yeah, yeah, I can add well, one thing. Uh, we, as I said before, I expect the regulators uh, push more and more on the digital. So it will uh, create a good base for the local players also to move forward. Uh, and uh, one of the important effects of this uh, pandemic will be the uh, localization. Uh, every country is uh, turned into uh, their inside a lot. So uh, that's why I agree with the mic. Uh, it will be hyper local uh, thing. Right, but I, I, I challenge you on this because you're the one who said a bank can talk to every customer differently in every place, right? So couldn't they also set up their systems to, to talk to the Saudi customer in a very specific way? Yeah, uh, this, this is, uh, you are right. But in that case, uh, they need to uh, rechange from value proposition, uh, technology may be the same, technology adaptable, but mostly value proposition uh, because uh, totally different uh, markets and now, uh, these differences will uh, will be much more uh, uh, visible. So they need to uh, they can customize. If it's the, that's why we said that it it should be hyper localized. Hyper localized, very personalized. All these kind of trends that we're hearing again and again. Very interesting, gents. Um, uh, I'm gonna ask uh, another question that ties to what we're saying. And it's also a question that one of our uh, attendees asked. Mike, you said we have the talent, right? We can yep. build something better. Yep. Uh, what is the talent that we have? What's the talent that's missing? What are the talent that you're looking to hire? What do you think? How is this going to change the type of talent that banks are looking for? All of these things. Oh. And, and the other question that I have for you is other than the talent, the culture. Uh, I visited you at the Saudi al Ferenci. I've seen the first floor that you've built out to look and feel different than a bank, to have a different culture than a bank. So uh, how do we, how are banks going to change that like kind of stuffy professional suit and tie? I see neither of you are wearing a suit or a tie. Uh, how do we expect the talent needs to change and the culture to change? And we'll start with you, Mike. Yeah, so look, I, um, you know, on culture, you know, that old adage of, you know, culture eats kind of, you know, strategy for breakfast. Ne never, never, ever a truer word, right, as uh, has been spoken. Um, I think, you know, when I look at, you know, the skill sets that we need, it definitely exists in this region. I think the skill sets that we want gravitate more to the cool, funky startup. 
as opposed to the older legacy bank. There are things that I can't offer people yet, and I'm trying to change it, but there are things that I can't offer people to steal them away from a startup because I can't offer them equity, for instance. I can't offer them that upside. I can offer you a decent salary. I've got plenty of runway. We're not going to be closed down. There's that job security. You know, our, our culture is as, as a, aligned to a startup, the way we kind of think and stuff. Um, but it's tough. Um, I don't think the, you know, the talent that we want is in huge supply, such as it is in a money center like London today. So we import a lot. Um, but we're doing a lot as well in terms of sending, you know, people that we have into London to work with, you know, teams that we have there, you know, to kind of, you know, further, you know, develop. But, you know, you look the world over, the type of talent, the digital needs. And if you want the best, and for us, that's the, that's absolutely non-negotiable. Um, it's in demand, right? And it's scarce. But when I put the regional lens over that, I genuinely think that it it uh, it magnifies by a factor of ten. It's um it's it's tough. It's really so really. If we can tough. be a little bit more specific, Mike. Today, if you could talk to us about skill sets, you talked a lot about data and data scientists. Yeah, Are there absolutely. Other skill sets that you could say, I'm looking for one, two, three, four, five. Because we also know COVID is going. There's going to be a lot of upheaval. Um, companies are going to close. People are going to lose their jobs. People are going to be looking to pick up new skills to be more relevant for the new world and for new opportunities. What kind yeah. of skills should those be? What should they be focused on? What kind of jobs, like I can imagine with everything we talked about the branch, there will be fewer uh, brand bank teller jobs available. However, there will be other new types of jobs. What, what would be those jobs and the skill sets required? Yeah, sure. So, you, you know, without going into kind of, you know, minutiae of detail in terms of, you know, you should be studying Python for data science, and I want React Native, you know, it, it's on a broader level, absolutely data science. I think the demand for that is just going to continue to grow and grow. You know, we're always going to need bankers, right? We're always going to need people that understand how to, to manage risk uh, around that. So there's still some kind of, uh, you know, opportunity for that. Um, I think, you know, proposition design, both mobile and online is going to be uh, critical and that's not necessarily just from a ui and a ux perspective but true kind of product kind of development um and i think forward looking strategy people um you know at, at bsf we go out we try and hire the best from tier one kind of you know consulting firms to you know to do strategy with us um and it's not your atypical kind of you know, bank and corporate strategy, we're asking them to really start to think, what's the art of the possible? How do we reimagine what we do? Because we have this belief that if we're going to get to where we want to be and reach our ambition, it's not, we're not going to get there if we start from where we are. So we need to think of another kind of, you know, point of departure to get to our destination. So I think, you know, um, more around data science, proposition <clears throat> design, product development, you know, risk will always, always be a big thing. And then, you know, front end, back end development platform engineers. Yeah. Bring them on, please. We can't get enough. Beautiful. Of beautiful. Can't get enough of very, very clear and, and specific. Then is any other things, uh, add yes. jobs that you would add? Yes. I can add one more thing because expatriation will be more and more difficult because of this uh, pandemic part. We are in the middle of the VUCA. My expectation is we are talking about uh, open banking. So you know this uh, platform-based talent markets for design, developments, and people currently- like Freelance it's, marketplaces? Freelance markets. Okay. It's been seven or eight weeks uh, on many banks are working remotely. So banks are now uh, getting used to working remotely. So my expectation is uh, starting to work with the people outside of the bank through, based on through these uh, talent platforms like GitHub, Behance, this kind of stuff uh, yep. will be a uh, go up. And the banks uh, cannot reach the pace of this uh, change because crisis is moving really very fast and the banks doesn't have enough resources and they're also dealing with the legacy to uh, deal with this crisis. So 
definitely they need to work with the outside. Okay, great. And, and really very, very uh, insightful answers. Um, Jad, can we get the answers to the, to the survey we just did? And I think Jad managed to fix the uh, setup so that you can now vote as panelists. <laughs> oh, excellent. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, similar to what I thought, virtual reality banking, uh, less so than social media, but people definitely interested in it. That's, it's, it was also surprising for me. I thought we'd get much fewer virtual reality. You know what? I'd love to have had the a, a third option, which was neither of the above. Yeah. So actually, initially, <laughs> when we designed this poll, we designed four or five uh, answers, which is why it feels a little bit uh, stunted. But the system didn't allow us except to put two options. So there were four or five kind of. I wanted to to think what are of all the options: beacons, virtual reality. What what people thought. So. Um, uh, before we ask, and, and I'm going to wrap up sh soon, uh, we do have more questions, but I'm not going to be able to get to a lot of them. I do want to ask about startups. And before I do that, I am going to cue the last uh, survey question, the last poll, which is about startups. And the last poll is really, would you feel comfortable putting your money in a non-bank financial technology startup? Right? We hear a lot about the idea that banks, beyond regulation, one of the, they bank on trust and the fact that customers don't feel comfortable giving their money to anybody. So I thought it would be interesting for us to see how, com how people will treat the trust factor uh, of fintechs. And, um, and so uh, on that note, while we give people the chance to answer that, um, I'm curious to know, uh, kind of with regarding, regarding startups, a lot of banks were already engaging in some kind of innovation programs. Uh, we're seeing banks that are doing investment funds, accelerators, uh, internal labs, every kind of uh, strategy. We'd be very interested to hear what strategies do you think are, have been most successful for banks? And how is the crisis going to change that appetite of banks to, to collaborate with startups or the, the way of collaboration? Um, Dennis, maybe we'll start with you. You were very active in this and have been in the past as well with TEB. You worked with a lot of startups. What is your, your experience on this? Yeah, the, currently, bank, most of the bank doesn't have enough policies uh, to uh, deal with this collaboration with the fintechs in terms of agility or in terms of processes. Uh, they're looking for some people. Uh, they treated the fintechs as a very big tech uh, companies. Uh, they're looking, putting the same process. So it should be definitely changed and currently, uh, I think that this uh, outbreak uh, is pushing the banks, pushing the not only the banks, by the way, or the big organizations to uh, work with the fintechs and uh, other uh, startups uh, a lot. And currently, uh, we are seeing that most of the uh, big companies, institutions, other than the banks, uh, is turning to a fintech because of their uh, they put to their payments. Uh, long, so uh, they are started to uh, collaborate instead of a bank. So uh, this will also push the banks and uh, definitely we will see much more better uh, collaboration in between the banks and the uh, fintechs. Do you expect this to, in, to increase the in, not just the frequency but the type of collaboration? For example, do we expect to see a lot more acquisitions or investments in startups uh, now? Yeah, uh, two things. Uh, yes, definitely. Uh, because so far the relationship, sorry, the relationship has kind of been lukewarm. Oh, let's partner. Maybe we do a product together. Give me your stuff. I'll That's try to nice to have you. part. La, 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 la. But that I... would be nice to have part. Now, yeah. it should be a, because the banks need to catch this pace. And they don't have enough resources. They have to. On the other uh, part, I want to give an example. Uh, I know very, a very big energy company, uh, electric distribution company. They need a solution. They couldn't get it from their banks and they find the fintechs and that fintechs uh, developing such a system for that company and connecting to a bank because bank doesn't have the enough resources. The, these big companies have money but doesn't have the resources. So this kind of collaboration we will see much more. And at the end of the seeing a, a positive outcome, I'm 100% sure that we will see more and more uh, fintech acquisition by banks, but also the other companies. Okay. Mike, um, I think you also have a different experience. Having been on the, on the startup side, 
and experience maybe some rough, uh, uh, you know, challenges with the banks and engaging with them. Um, how do you see this changing? Yeah, so I think it's changed. I don't think it's changed as much. You know, we were probably three years too early in, in what we were trying to do. Um, we were also kind of, we, all, we, all, we also made people feel like that they were turkeys voting for Christmas and Thanksgiving, if you know what I mean. Um, uh, so, and, and everybody genuinely believed their own kind of Kool-Aid, you know, we can do this ourselves. And I haven't, honestly, I haven't seen that, that happen. Right. So, um, you know, that's not the case, but I think a, a lot of it really depends upon the board and the management, you know, the, that executive management's appetite and their positioning in the midst of this kind of crisis. Right. So some players, are going to be completely scared off from deploying venture capital into startups, right? Whereas I believe that now's the time that I can go and get better valuations. I can go and get a better bank for book. You know, I think the hot air is finally going to be released um, from, the, from, the, from the fintech kind of balloon. Um, so I see massive kind of, you know, uh, you know d decreases in valuation around that. I think, you know, some banks are going to think, you know, partnering with fintech, it's just a distraction. This is to Dennis's point, you know, you, you go and ask for, you know, I need a head of kind of fintech partnerships. Oh, I'm not sure we need that. You know, can't you, it, we do, right? These things take time. If I've got a head Why of partnership. Because, because for, Mike, we haven't been able to drive dollar value impact to the bottom line from these collaborations. Never take it seriously, right? We play at it. You know, I mean, honestly, I see so many accelerators and companies getting on and banks putting their name on it. And they're just bloody vanity accelerators. They don't do anything for the, you know, the fintech. They don't help that entrepreneur that's risking, you know, his entire kind of, uh, you know, livelihood uh, on the whole. Um, and, and we do a little pilot. You've got to get people that are really serious uh, around this. And this is why, you know, that relationship between bank and fintech comes down to the mindsets of the people driving it. And it's on both sides, right? It, it's just as much on the banker side as it is on the fintech side. And if you get that meeting of minds, then honestly, beautiful things will happen. It's, 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 it's really as simple as that. But it's just about having agendas aligned, passion aligned, you know, that type of stuff. Um, and at the moment, um, you know, the way banks are run as well, it's, it's, it's just doesn't engender long-term thinking. It's, oh, what does this mean for me, for my bonus at the end of this year? What if I'm not here, etc.? just doesn't work. And it's about time we put, you know, our institutions before our own needs. So, uh, yeah, I'm very passionate about this bit, I have to say haven't been through both sides of it well look i and i and i totally understand and i think um i think you're right that it's on both sides we had a i was on another panel and the discussion was about not only do the enterprises need to be startup ready but the startups need to be enterprise ready 100%. and i see i see these issues on both sides startups that that don't have the robustness of technology or product or understanding of the complexity of of enterprise but also enterprises that have no real fast track processes for collaboration, no real empowered decision making, yeah, no yeah. Um, thought given to a better terms for collaboration that are more equitable and more favorable. And I, I think that's where th there's, there's that gap in expectations and, and, and thought. And I think you're right that the banks and startups that are able to close that gap are going to find tremendous synergy and capture tremendous value. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I, I cannot one more thing. Uh, I just read an article last week about the, uh, the World FinTech Report 2020. There are two uh, figures that uh, attract my attention. One of them, only 6% of the banks are happy about the desired ROI from the collaboration with the FinTechs. So most yes. of these projects, only 6% based on the this survey. And 70% uh, of the uh, uh, FinTechs are very frustrated about uh, uh, partnership and uh, so both sides are not uh, happy at the moment it's obvious on the other hand i want to go back my analogy formula one rain tour analogy 
on these <laughs> times, uh, everything can be changed. And some of the uh, institutions, fintechs, who cannot uh, adapt their, themselves to the new normal, uh, will disappear or will, will be uh, in the uh, bottom side of the ranking. So uh, maybe they will continue their life, but we will see a different ranking. So the, uh, I strongly believe that if the management, if the bank uh, believes these collaborations, and if this is not just for the cosmetic or uh, lipstick kind of stuff, uh, it should be a really a creates the value for the uh, both sides. Wonderful, and I think this goes back to a theme that we, we've already chatted, that this uh, crisis is going to be a differentiator and not everyone's gonna get out of it. And those that are gonna be more agile, uh, more able to capture the digital transformation, both internally and customer facing, and figure out how to work with partners like startups to capture new and emerging opportunities are the banks that are gonna survive and others are gonna either languish, move towards the back end, or as then as you're saying, fall in the rankings and the whole, everything is up for grabs in this uh, crazy time. Uh, Jad, if we can put the, the, as a wrap up, the uh, results of our last poll and see what do people think about startup? Ooh. <laughs> Would you feel comfortable putting your money in a non-bank financial technology startup? Only 58% said that they would feel comfortable. 42% uh, said they would not feel comfortable. So I guess this shows that banks still have a lot of credibility and trust with people and startups have a lot, a lot to go before people will trust them with their money. Any thoughts on, uh, final thoughts on, on this poll? I buy that. I absolutely buy it. I, um, you know, when you look at Monzo and Starling in the UK, uh, I'm sorry to be so biased because I'm British, but um, people use those two banks not as their primary institution, you know, the, you know, we, you know, I think that the, you know, the term that's been coined is shoeboxing and it's essentially, I've got my big bank, I'm with Barclays, all my money goes in there. And then I transfer each month a little bit of kind of, of my liquidity, my disposable income into Starling or into Monzo. And it kind of helps me understand it's a bit easier to use and so on and so forth. Um, and, and, you know, they're a bank, right? That's not a non-bank financial technology startup. Yeah. They are a fully, full-on bank. It's got full-on kind of, um, you know, state guarantees behind them of, of their deposits. You're not going to lose your money there. But, you know, the, the, the proposition isn't rich enough. I can't get a mortgage there. I can't get, you know, big personal loans, auto loans. So I still need my big bank, right? I still do. So, uh yeah, I, 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 I kind of buy this 100%. Dennis, your, your last thoughts on this as well. Uh, yeah, I may agree with uh, uh, Paul. Uh, my expectation is yes, but we'll go up in the near future. Sorry, what will go up in the near future? Yeah, uh, yes, but. Oh. The yes part will go up in the near future. Yes, I think I, I, I kind of agree with you, but um, I totally understand, Mike, what you're saying. And part of that as well is, the credibility of brands that have been there for a long time. When we say a brand like Barclays, it carries a long, long tradition of trust. That Monzo, even though they have a lot of maybe the regulatory and government support, they don't, they don't have that brand trust yet. And yeah, so- but it, You know, it's even more of an extension than that, right? Because we know that big banks fail. Who would have guessed that kind of, all right, I know it's an investment bank, but who would have guessed that Lehman's would have gone? Who would have guessed that, you know, some of those big ass kind of you know us retail banks would have gone under as well during that crisis but the fact that as a bank license holder i can guarantee in the uk it doesn't apply to this this uh, region but in other parts of the world i can guarantee that your deposits will always be safe whereas a non-bank financial technology company can't they go your money goes and until they get the same kind of support um as as banks do um it, it will hinder them unfortunately what we have seen in uh, for these digital bank people definitely looking for the trust and it's for sure on the other hand uh, big conglomerates or big players uh, get uh, digital bank license and open these things 
And if the customers wants to see a bank name or very reputable uh, a conglomerate or a, a other company, for example, Alibaba opens uh, one of the license, the other one, the tech giants uh, got a, a license. So when the people see that uh, part over there and also the regulator name, I think it will uh, it will create the impact on the yes side, but. Uh, definitely it will take more time. It's not easy because there is a big habit. Uh, so people looking for the uh, bank brands, uh, bank names uh, behind the digital banks at the moment. Beautiful. Gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for your time. I've enjoyed this tremendously. Really great conversation, chemistry, lots of strong opinions and insights. I hope our attendees also enjoyed it. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. And we'll look forward to hopefully seeing you again uh, in person soon, or, or if not, uh, over video chat very soon again. Thank Always you. a pleasure. Ramadan Kareem, everyone. And, yes, uh, Ramadan Kareem. Indeed. Ramadan Kareem, it's a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank best. you, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Bye-bye.